Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome into another edition of Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Wednesday, December 13th, and thank you for getting your day started here by making this your first listen of the day. I'm Tyler Bojack, and I'm the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018, and now I'm a producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 Moneyline bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. It is finally official. Mark Streeman and his staff landed their top target in the transfer portal on Tuesday when Duke's Riley Leonard announced on his social media that he's committed to play for the Fighting Irish next season in what will be his final season of eligibility. And I am just so excited that I don't have to dance around this topic with you anymore as if Leonard might not go to Notre Dame because it's been the worst kept secret in all of college football since the transfer portal opened on December 4th and really even before that if we're being honest because this is always where Riley Leonard was going to end up. So today I'm going to go over what this move means for the Irish in 2024 and beyond because I think this move represents some important developments relating to the university's buy-in to the football program that actually extend far beyond this season. Plus, I'll explain why Notre Dame chose to go this route and how it happened. But to start, let's talk about what kind of player the Irish are getting in Riley Leonard. And here's the headline. Riley Leonard has the highest ceiling of any quarterback Notre Dame has had in over a decade. Let me be clear. I'm not saying that Riley Leonard is the best quarterback Notre Dame has had in over a decade. He's not, at least not right now, but he could be because he has the size and all the tools you would want in a quarterback in the modern era of college football. Leonard is not a finished product. He's got a lot of raw ability, and there is no doubt he'll have to develop and improve on key areas during his loan season with the Irish. But if you look at what, or if you look at his upside, and that's what I'm referring to here when I reference his ceiling, it's better than Sam Hartman's. It's better than Ian Books, Jack Cones, Deshaun Kaiser's. I think it goes all the way back to Jimmy Clausen. Although the jury's still out on Drew Pine, though. No, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I just I couldn't help myself. That was mean. Anyway, let's get back to Leonard. Leonard is an absolute tank for the quarterback position. He's listed at 6'4", 212 pounds, and he's a freak of an athlete. He was throwing down windmill dunks in high school basketball that would honestly be pretty entertaining in a slam dunk contest. And pre-COVID, Leonard actually intended to play college basketball before he decided to devote himself to football. It's worked out for him so far. And you could see his athleticism when he's carrying the ball. He's rushed for over 1,200 yards and 19 touchdowns in three seasons at Duke. He led the Blue Devils in rushing during his sophomore season with 699 yards. And 805 of his career rushing yards have come after contact. That's incredible for a quarterback. He is just so difficult to bring down in the backfield or really anywhere on the field because he's also very elusive. He can break almost any run for a touchdown, and you saw that against Clemson in the season opener this past season. He also has a really strong arm, and he can make some throws down the field. And going into 2023, most people thought it was going to be Leonard's final season of college football because a lot of NFL scouts loved his size and his skill set. Dane Brugler, a very well-respected draft analyst for The Athletic, he's the guy who writes The Beast every year, which is like the longest, most comprehensive draft guide before every NFL draft. He had Leonard as high as 28th on his big board going into the season. That is a potential first-round pick. I'll read you an excerpt from a scouting report on him. Quote, Possibly the best quarterback you haven't watched yet. Leonard is coming off a season in which he ranked in the top 25 in passing and scrambling EPA. He's a strong-armed athlete with enough long speed to hurt a defense as a runner, the latest in a long line of former Duke coach David Cutcliffe's development projects. Leonard is still a point-and-shoot passer, which makes 2023 an opportunity to add more touch throws and control to his portfolio. End quote. Obviously, 
Leonard's 2023 season did not go as planned or else he would be declaring for the NFL draft and not entering the transfer portal. He got hurt on the Blue Devils' last drive against Notre Dame, and then he tried to come back and play against Louisville and Florida State, but then he got hurt again. It basically wiped out the second half of his season. And to me, the fact that he was even able to go against Louisville and Florida State is really impressive because that injury did not look good. We were all watching that game. We watched him go down and we watched some of the reaction from the Duke players. He was in the medical tent for a long time, had to come off the field on crutches. And that's when you got that great moment between Riley Leonard and Sam Hartman. So he tried to give it a go. It really didn't work out. And that really hurt his production for all of last season. If you look at his stat line, it's not really that impressive. He finished with just over 1,100 yards passing, three touchdowns to three interceptions, and 352 rushing yards with four touchdowns on the ground in total for 2023. But if you look back to his sophomore season, Leonard broke out and racked up nearly 3,000 pass yards, 20 touchdowns to six interceptions. And as I said earlier, he led Duke with just under 700 rushing yards, and he had 13 rushing touchdowns. That is the type of production Notre Dame expects to get out of Leonard this season, if not better. So if he's able to stay healthy this season, he has the chance to be a truly dynamic quarterback in the run game and the pass game that Notre Dame really hasn't had in a long time. I made the reference in yesterday's show that it kind of reminds me of Deshaun Kaiser because of their size and Deshaun's running ability. Um, Kaiser was really great in short yarded situations, and I expect Notre Dame will utilize Leonard uh, in the same way when he's the quarterback in the blue and gold. But there are definitely some things that he needs to get better at. One, he needs to stay healthy. That was an issue for him last year, dealt with multiple injuries that really derailed his entire season and derailed Duke's uh, season in Mike Elko's last year with the Blue Devils. So he needs to stay healthy with the Irish next season. But really, my biggest concern with him is his accuracy. First career, Leonard's completion percentage is 61.6%. Uh, that's serviceable, but his inaccuracy showed against the better defenses that he played. I mean, if you look at the game against Notre Dame last season, he finished 12 of 27, uh, passing with one touchdown and one interception. But in fairness to him, Notre Dame had one of, if not the best pass defenses in all of college football last season. Like, if we judge Caleb Williams based solely on his performance against the Irish last year, we think he's a bum. Instead, Caleb Williams is probably going to be the number one overall pick in uh, the next NFL draft. Leonard was more accurate against Clemson. He finished 17 of 33 for 175 yards, but no touchdowns through the air. He did run for 98 yards and had a touchdown on the ground, uh, which is great. But you definitely liked him. Uh, you definitely like to see him be more accurate with the ball. I used to think that accuracy wasn't something that you could be taught. I thought you either had it uh, or you didn't. But then Jalen Hurts and some other quarterbacks forced me to change my mind on that. So this is an area where Riley Leonard can definitely improve at Notre Dame. I think um, having better skilled players around him will certainly help in that regard. But another thing, too, when, when Leonard misses, it is a loud miss. Like, he had a throw against Notre Dame. You're like, what the hell was that? And when he has throws like that, it makes all the other minor mistakes seem a little bit worse. I don't know. I think that's just the way that we process these things. But uh, I think part of his accuracy issues have to do with his technique. Sometimes it, it can get a little sloppy because I think he just relies on his athleticism. He starts to fling the ball instead of using proper mechanics. You see that uh, from time to time with these very athletic uh, quarterbacks who are also that big. And timing is very important in Notre Dame offense. I don't know if his timing was that great with his Duke wide receivers. He actually admitted that going into the 2023 season. So that is something that he's going to have to work really hard with Notre Dame's wideouts during the offseason to get that timing down before the season starts. But if he can get on the same page with those guys, um, and Notre Dame has added to the wide receiver position in the transfer portal with Chris Mitchell and Bo Collins. Um, I think that's going to go a long way. Plus, if guys like Jaden Greathouse take the leap going into uh, his second year, and if Jaden Thomas is able to become the guy that a lot of us hoped he would be this season before he got hurt, uh, the, the pieces are there for Riley Leonard to have some success on the outside. Um, he also has to improve. His ball placement, I think that's going to come just with more reps with these guys and as he gets to play with them a little bit longer. But one thing Riley Leonard does have is experience. It's not close to what Sam Hartman had when he got to Notre Dame, but it's significant. Leonard has played in 27 games during his career, including 21 starts. He's 13-8 and eight, uh, for his career, but that is 21 more starts than anyone in Notre Dame's quarterback right now. Uh, until Angeli gets his first start in the bowl game, and then it becomes 20 more than everyone else in the room. And that is just 
so valuable in college football these days and something that we know Marcus Freeman prioritizes, especially at the quarterback position. And not only that, Leonard is considered a great teammate and a great leader. He was a captain while he was at Duke. Uh, he says that he prides himself on being the calmest guy out on the field, which is something you want out of your quarterback. His teammates look up to him. Uh, I like the fact that he deletes all of his social media during the season to try and block out the noise. Um, and by all accounts, he's just going to be a perfect fit in the Notre Dame locker room. And I think that's one of the main reasons why I feel that the best case scenario is more likely to happen than the worst case, because he's got the right mindset, he's got the tools, and I think he'll have enough weapons around him to succeed at Notre Dame. But we have to be honest here. It's not a guarantee that Riley Leonard comes in and, and lights the world on fire this fall. That there are definitely some situations in which that doesn't happen, but the potential for him to do it is there. And he has put together a full season of really high-level football before during his sophomore season, which I've already mentioned. And I think he has all the physical tools to become the first Notre Dame quarterback selected in the first round since Brady Quinn did in 2007, if he's able to put it all together. It's a risk for sure, and I think it's a risk worth taking because I think if Leonard does put it all together, he could be one of the most dynamic quarterbacks in the entire country next fall. But whenever you take a chance like this, there are potential consequences, specifically for Marcus Freeman, as he enters his third year as the head coach of the Fighting Irish. More on that coming right up. Today's episode of Locked On Irish is brought to you by Fandle. As the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on Fandle, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining Fandle lately, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use, and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. All right, for my pick this week, I'm sticking with the under of 34 uh, on the Thursday night football game between the Raiders and the Chargers. We're looking at uh, the Chargers playing without Justin Herbert, going up against Aiden O'Connell. The over-under did move up one, or half a point, I should say, because in yesterday's show I said it was 33 and a half. Now it is at 34. I'm sticking with the under. I actually went with the under last week uh, in Patriots-Chargers. I got burned on that, but I'm staying with the under again uh, on this one in the game tomorrow night. So visit Fandle.com slash locked on to kick off the NFL season. Fandle, an official partner of the NFL. Before we move on, please take a moment to like the video below and subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube. Or if you're listening to the podcast, please rate the show five stars if you like what you hear and subscribe there as well. If you're feeling extra generous, I'd really appreciate it if you wrote a review. I know it seems like a lot, but that kind of stuff does go a long way uh, in growing this show. So I'm very grateful for everyone who has done so already. All right, let's get back to Riley Leonard and specifically why did Marcus Freeman uh, and the staff pursue him? I think a lot of fans are trying to figure that out because from what I've seen, the reaction to this move from the fan base has been pretty split. Some people are really excited about adding Riley Leonard, and then there's some other fans who aren't as high on him. And I get that. Like I understand why some fans aren't sold on Leonard's ability. I'll be honest, as I was preparing to do this podcast in the week leading up to the Duke game and I was doing my preview shows and things like that, I also wondered what all the hype was about because I was hearing about him as this future NFL prospect, and I, I just didn't really see it at the time. Then there's a portion of the fan base who's just like simply annoyed with the fact that Notre Dame is going to go with the transfer quarterback for the third time in four years. I, I get it to some extent. You want to see your own guys get developed uh, and stick around on your team. But Jack Cohn went 11-1 and as the starter for Notre Dame as a grad transfer. And funny enough, a lot of the people who get mad at all the attention that Sam Hartman got... They were probably the ones who were begging for Drew Pine to play in place of Jack Cohn way back in 2021. I didn't forget that. That was a lot of people out there, and uh, that was the wrong decision. I'll admit, Sam Hartman did not live up to the expectations we had for him going into this season. I'll, I'll give you that. And it seems like a lot of people are taking out their frustration regarding Hartman uh, and taking it out on Riley Leonard. It's as if they think that just because Sam Hartman didn't pan out like we all had hoped, that's all of a sudden means that Riley Leonard is going to disappoint again just because he's a transfer. That's just not how this works. And even though Hartman didn't live up to the hype, he was still much, much better than the alternative. The alternative was Tyler Buckner, a guy who I liked, um, I thought he could be uh, a good college quarterback. He was certainly exciting when he played. Um, there were a lot of highs and lows watching Tyler Buckner, I'll tell you that much. But he played arguably one of the worst games I've ever seen a quarterback play as the quarterback for Alabama going up against South Florida. 
Then he got demoted to third string for Alabama the rest of the season, and now he's quit college football entirely to play lacrosse. So if Notre Dame had not gone out and got Sam Hartman, that 9-3 and three season could have easily been 8-4. and four. It definitely would have been at least 8-4 and because Notre Dame would have lost to Duke without Sam Hartman. And it could have even been 7-5 because Hartman was just so much better than Tyler Buckner, and we all saw that in the Blue and Gold game. Plus, any concerns uh, about adding a guy like Hartman that, that he would disrupt the locker room was clearly not the case. The team absolutely loved him. They voted him captain after being there for just a few months. And everything we've heard about how the team viewed him in the aftermath has just been nothing but positive. So, sure, you want to be mad that Notre Dame finished 93 with him? Um, sure. How mad would you have been if Notre Dame had finished 8-4 and four or worse because they didn't go out and get Hartman? I'm guessing you wouldn't be as happy about the development of the guys in the room in that scenario if it led to one or two more losses. And if you remember, Tommy Reese and the staff chose not to pursue a transfer quarterback in 2022 because they wanted to roll with Tyler Buckner as a true sophomore, let him rip, and look how that turned out in Marcus Freeman's first season. I honestly believe that one decision like still resonates so strongly in Marcus Freeman's brain. He was subjected to 10 games that Drew Pine experience was like, Never again. And look, I, I get it. I, I don't want the coaching staff to be in this position every single year. I want them to be able to recruit top-level quarterback prospects year in and year out, develop them at Notre Dame, let them compete, and let the best man win. The blueprint for how to recruit and develop quarterbacks is exactly what Alabama was able to do, uh, to do during the run from Jalen Hurts to Tua Tagovailoa to Mac Jones to Bryce Young. All of those guys, they recruited who waited their turn, and then they became elite college quarterbacks. But that is Alabama. It usually doesn't work out that way. And even they had their own issues at the position at the start of the year, like I just mentioned with Tyler Buckner and Jalen Milrow. The good thing is Notre Dame is certainly headed in that direction. Kenny Minchie, C.J. Carr, and Deuce Knight were all top quarterback prospects in their recruiting class. They probably won't all pan out, but I'd like to think that one of them is going to end up being a really good quarterback for the Irish. But not every quarterback recruit pans out, especially early on in their careers. So it's a big risk to play them too. Just look at how Drew Aller played this season as a retro freshman for Penn State. Five-star talent, all-world uh, ability. Every Notre Dame fan wanted him. He was terrible, all right, especially in the big games against Michigan and Ohio State, the same games that Notre Dame fans desperately want to win. Remember Dante Moore? Remember that whole thing, the can't miss five-star? He started as a true freshman. He threw nine interceptions, including two pick sixes, and got benched before the end of the year at UCLA. Now he's in the transfer portal. And Drew Aller and Dante Moore might end up being great players, but when they're young and inexperienced, playing them is a huge risk, even if they have a ton of talent. Unfortunately, Notre Dame missed at the quarterback position in recruiting for years, and they've had to make up for that in the transfer portal. And those misses lead directly to these kinds of decisions. So once again, Marcus Freeman had to decide, do I roll with the guy I have, most likely Steve Angeli, and let him start at the most important position on the field in what will be the most important year in Freeman's entire coaching career, or go out and get a guy who they believe is clearly an upgrade at the position? It's really that simple. They believe Riley Leonard is more talented and he's certainly far more experienced, which makes him more reliable than the guys they have, and that's why the staff pursued him so aggressively. Marks Freeman and the staff cannot afford to, quote, see what they have. That's a phrase I hear way too often on message boards. It doesn't even make sense. In Steve Angeli and Kenny Minchie and roll the dice in them next season, it's just way too risky. They need to put together the best roster they possibly can every single year let the competition weed guys out, and the best guys will rise to the top. That is the nature of college football these days, and it's happening everywhere around the country. 42 of the 67 opening day starting quarterbacks in the Power Five last season were transfers. This year's Heisman Trophy winner, quarterback Jaden Daniels, transferred from Arizona State to LSU. The runner-up, Michael Penix, transferred from Indiana to Washington. Bo Nix, who finished fourth, was a transfer. Jordan Travis was a transfer. The year before that, Caleb Williams won the Heisman after he transferred. The 2019 Heisman Trophy winner, Joe Burrow, was a transfer. Now, does that mean all transfer quarterbacks are going to work out? Nope, but a lot of them do, particularly those at the highest level because they have more experience than the younger than the younger. Um, highly recruited guys. Marcus Freeman and his staff believe that Riley Leonard has the potential to play at or near the level of a lot of the guys I just mentioned. And whenever you say, well, how do they know what they have with the guys in the room? 
I don't know, probably because they watch them every single day in practice and have done so for the past two years, as is the case with Steve Angeli, and one year in the case of Kenny Minchie. And even though Steve Angeli hasn't started a game yet, the coaching staff has a pretty damn good idea of what kind of player he is because these coaches spend more time with these players than their own families. And I understand it can be intoxicating watching Steve Angeli come in during blowouts and carve up bad defenses when the game is already over. His stats were great this year. 19 of 25, 272 passing yards, four touchdowns, one interception. Granted, a lot of those yards came after the catch, but still, he played well when he was asked to go out on the field. And I don't want this to sound like I'm bashing Steve Angeli. I hope he plays great in the bowl game, and I hope he sticks around. He'd be great to have on the roster next year in case Leonard gets hurt. But the staff had a chance to evaluate Riley Leonard for months before the, they played Duke this year, and the offensive staff asked the defensive staff, how do you feel about him? And they were all like, Yeah, really good player, really difficult to prepare for. And Notre Dame went out and got him out of the transfer portal. They looked at Leonard, they looked at what they had in the quarterback room, and they thought, yep, one option is definitely better than the other. That option is Riley Leonard, so they went with him. It's really that simple, and I think we're all going to just have to trust the staff on this one. But whenever you make a move like this, it does send a message to the rest of the team that you're going for it. And there are going to be some dominoes that fall as a result that are going to affect the program for a couple years down the line. That's coming right up. Today's episode is sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to have as many top tier candidates as possible to interview. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. I used LinkedIn Jobs a couple years ago, and they made it easy to contact a hiring manager, learn more about the role, and eventually I got the job. We all know hiring people can be time-consuming, but adding the right team member can be invaluable to your business, and LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier than ever. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. They have a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. Thankfully, with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even even easier and quicker. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the quality candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, so let's take a look at what this move means for Notre Dame down the road. To me, it shows that Marcus Freeman recognizes the importance of the upcoming season for his program and his coaching career. I said earlier on the show that I believe this is the most important year he's had in his entire coaching career, and it makes sense. It's his third season as the head coach for Notre Dame. First year, kind of like, all right, you know, got to be patient. You have the Marshall game, you have the Stanford game. I think the fans had an understanding that he was going to have to learn on the job a little bit. Second year, they make improvements. There's one more win during the regular season, but then there's also those big mistakes uh, against Ohio State, especially at the end of the game, and then the absolute duds against Louisville and Clemson. So it's like, okay, they made some growth. They need to keep that going into next season and also have to point out that Brian Kelly took Notre Dame to a national championship in his third season. Lou Holtz won a national championship in year three. Same with Eric Parsegian and Frank Leahy. Am I saying that it's national championship or bust for Marcus Freeman in his third season? No. But it's definitely college football playoff or bust, especially with the expanded playoff. Like, the expectation now for Notre Dame every single season should be to make the college football playoff because they should be in the top 12 every single year at the end of the year. Before the expanded playoff, I would say that it was not a fair expectation for Notre Dame to get in the playoff every year, but they were able to make it two times during the 10-year span of the 14 playoff. Now they should be making it every year, or at least they should be close to making it every single year, but particularly next season, because if they go 9-3 and again, that just shows that the program is stagnant, they're not making the growth that they need to make, and they're not getting into the college football playoff at 9-3. and That's just not good enough. They have to finish at least 10-2, and two, and with how weak next year's schedule might be, it, they might need to go 11-1. and one. Maybe that should be the expectation, honestly. Now, obviously, strength of schedule is going to change between now, as I'm talking here, and December of 2023 compared to next season, but you get my point. And in order to achieve that goal, Notre Dame went out and got Riley Leonard, who is one of the top quarterbacks and really top prospects in the entire transfer portal, and they, I'm not really breaking any news here, are going to pay a pretty hefty price to do it. 
I don't know all the details, but I think it's pretty clear that Riley Leonard is, is going to make a lot of NIL money next season, much like Sam Hartman did for Notre Dame this past season. And that is a good thing. Even if you aren't sure if Riley Leonard is worth a million or two million or however much money he makes during his loan season at Notre Dame, it really doesn't matter. That's the going rate for quarterbacks. Matt Rule even said so a couple, actually it was this past week, when he said that the uh, to get a top quarterback in the transfer portal, you got to pay at least $1.5 to $2 million. And for some really high-level quarterback recruits, it's about the same price. But it, it's not my money. It's probably not your money either. So why do you care? If anything, this should be a sign that this Notre Dame program and this university is willing to step up and do what it takes to win in this era both in NIL and the transfer portal, because that's another component in all of this. Riley Leonard is not a grad transfer. Neither is former Clemson wide receiver Bo Collins, who announced his transfer to Notre Dame earlier this week. And for years, we had heard that Notre Dame was not going to be able to add transfers in the portal unless they got them after their freshman season or if they had already graduated. So to me, this is a sign that the university and the admissions office have taken steps in the right direction to fix that and expedite the process when Notre Dame does want to transfer so that they can get players out of the portal in a timely manner because there's a ton of competition and Notre Dame just has more um, jumps to go through than anyone else just given the rigors of the admissions office. And again, that, I'm not saying that's those should all go away, but they needed to make some progress there. And Mark Streeman alluded to that progress in some press conferences. Um, he's been pretty optimistic about the entire operation, and it also backs up some of the reports we've heard that things were trending in the right direction. Notre Dame is notorious for being slow to change at just about everything, but I think this is a clear indicator that real change is happening, and that is absolutely huge for the program. Like, it cannot be overstated because we know how vital the transfer portal is to the success of teams in the modern era of college football. And Notre Dame was basically playing with one arm behind their back because they weren't able to even uh, recruit all the guys in the portal. That is starting to change. So well done to everyone who is involved. Um, that is a big, big development for Notre Dame going down the road here. And as for the other potential consequences, Notre Dame now has four scholarship quarterbacks. Um, there is absolutely no way, in my mind, that they have the same four scholarship quarterbacks on the roster going into the 2024 season. It's not going to be C.J. Carr. He's not going to transfer, at least not now. Um, and it's obviously not going to be Riley Leonard, so it's going to be either Steve Angeli or Kenny Minchie. I could honestly see it going either way. Steve Angeli would make the most sense to transfer because he's going to be entering his third season of college football, but he's also pretty close to his degree. As I understand, he grew up a Notre Dame fan, so... You know, maybe he decides to stick it out, graduate, and then transfer uh, as a grad transfer. Kenny Minchie would be a bit of a surprise, considering he's only been around for one year. But if Steve Angeli decides to stay, and then Minchie is the third-string quarterback next year, then I think he's almost certainly out the door. Personally, I hope they both stay for at least the spring. You know, let them battle it out, figure out who's going to be the backup, because as I mentioned in the first segment— Riley Leonard has been prone to injuries in his career. There's a very real chance that he goes down at some point this season, and then the backup has to not only start, maybe they have to play a few games, whoever that backup ends up being. So I think the best-case scenario for Notre Dame, Minchie and Angeli, battle it out to be the backup quarterback during spring practice, and then whoever uh, ends up being third string goes elsewhere. And sure, there there is a chance that C.J. Carr um, really blows everyone away and, and really fights for that backup quarterback spot. And even though I think C.J. Carr will have a good career at Notre Dame, I just I just think the jump from high school to college uh, for true freshmen is just so difficult. Like I already mentioned Dante Moore and the struggles that he, fa uh, he faced this season. It's just a lot to ask for a true freshman. So I don't expect C.J. Carr to really make a dent on the two deep this year. Um, so... If I had to guess who's going to end up transferring, I think it's probably going to be Minchie, which sounds weird, but I do think that Steve Vancelli might stick around, um, and I think that Minchie is going to have a greater market than Steve Angeli when, it, when or if he decides to transfer because he was a top recruit um, and his eligibility doesn't even really start until next season because he just redshirted this past season. Is it an unfortunate consequence of the way things work nowadays in college football? Absolutely. 
uh, it sucks for these guys that sometimes a guy who's hasn't been around the program comes in and, and immediately takes the starting job. But this is a big business. It business is really only good if you're winning, especially at Notre Dame. And Notre Dame believes they have seriously improved their chances of winning this season by going out and getting Riley Leonard. That is going to do it for this episode. Thanks again for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. Quick programming note on the way out. Right now, I'm not sure if I'll be able to get an episode up tomorrow. I've got a big event for my job at Fox that's going to take up my entire day. But either way, I will definitely be back by Friday with another mailbag episode. So if you've got thoughts or questions about Riley Leonard or other players in the transfer portal or or really anything you want to talk about, send them my way. As always, you can drop your questions in the comments if you're watching on YouTube, uh, or you can submit them on social media. The X account for the show is at Lockdown Irish. Instagram is at Lockdown Irish Pod. Um, And you can hit me up on my personal X account. It's at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. And of course, please subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And I will see you guys very soon.